From a small Chinese telecommunications company to a global tech giant, Ren Zhengfei has built Huawei's brand over three decades. But he's now at the center of the U.S.-China trade war, leading a company Washington considers a national security risk. We sat down with the CEO and founder at his headquarters in Shenzhen to discuss allegations of espionage, intellectual property theft, and his company's future. Let's talk about um, what has played out between the U.S. and China. Um, a few weeks ago at the G20, um, President Trump and President Xi Jinping met, and one of the points of discussion was to allow for some licenses so American suppliers can begin selling to Huawei again. What shipments have resumed since then? I don't think we were fully prepared for being added to the entity list, so we faced some pressure. However, after we tried to sort out our internal problems, we found that we are fully capable of shaking off our reliance on the U.S. for our core products and depending on ourselves to survive. But we also have many other products that cannot do without U.S. components, so we cut some of these products to reduce the pressure. Over 80,000 members of our technical staff are working hard to fix other holes in the development of our company. From what we're seeing today, we've made pretty good progress. The remarks made by Trump at the G20 summit have had no substantial impact on Huawei yet. His remarks indicated the U.S. is no longer trying to strike blindly at Huawei. When they added us to the entity list, even McDonald's in Mexico stopped selling to us. This suggested that the U.S. had no idea which products were actually not important and whether their supply to Huawei could be continued at that time. Trump's remarks have helped many small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, in the U.S. Resuming supply to us has boosted their sales. Of course, his remarks also allowed us to resume production for part of our products. Overall, as long as the U.S. shows a friendly attitude, we will continue to buy components from this country. We believe the world will ultimately collaborate for shared success. You mentioned some SMEs have resumed shipments. Can you tell us which specific companies? I am not that clear about the details. To my knowledge, the supply of the vast majority of less critical components has resumed. This is a good thing. It can help some U.S. companies change their business performance. But the U.S. has not made any decisions on the supply of critical components yet. I estimate that they will need around two more weeks to make a decision. If they don't make a decision, we will. What the Commerce Department over in the U.S. has said is that if these are components that are readily available, um, they will grant licenses so they can supply Huawei. Those that have national security concerns will not. Uh, I'm wondering, th there's a lot of confusion in the U.S. What is your understanding of what constitutes national security in terms of the components that you take in? I don't know what the national security concern is to the U.S. We don't have any networks in the U.S., nor do we intend to sell our 5G products there anyway, so there's no way we can pose a threat to the U.S. I think the U.S. is too apprehensive. At the end of the day, collaborating for shared success is the only way forward. The U.S. is the most powerful and the most technologically capable nation in the world. It should have more confidence in its ability to address cybersecurity issues. There's not one individual component that can threaten the national security of the U.S. 5G is just a tool that helps networks operate faster. It's good for the world. 5G is not an atomic bomb. How has it become a threat? Secondly, we have no plans to sell our 5G products to the U.S., so there is no way it's a threat to the U.S. I think the U.S. is too apprehensive. I heard you recently say that um, the U.S. has helped us in a great way by giving us these difficulties, the implication being that you have been able to accelerate your efforts for increasing self-reliance. I'm wondering if that's the case, you know, what do you see as your future with some of these partners that you have had, like Intel or Qualcomm or Micron in the U.S.? If the U.S. companies are allowed to supply us, we will continue to buy from them, even in areas where we have developed our own alternatives. We adopted this approach in the past. Last year, we bought 50 million chipsets from Qualcomm, even though we have our own complete chipset portfolio. This year, we could probably make about 270 million phones, and we authorize our consumer business to buy 100 million chipsets from Qualcomm. We can live without Qualcomm, but we are still committed to working with them. Intel is a provider of our x86 servers. We also have our Taishan servers, powered by our Kunpeng CPUs. We will redouble our efforts to make our products even better over time. If Intel can continue supplying Huawei to help us maintain our leading position, then we will still buy in huge volumes from them.
We hope that Intel's x86 servers will be able to secure a 70% market share in the data communications area. We are only looking to obtain a tiny slice of the market, so that we will not squeeze Intel out. As long as the U.S. is open to Huawei, we will continue purchasing huge amounts of U.S. components, even in areas where we have developed our own alternatives. And as it stands uh, right now, um, you're still in a bit of a wait-and-see mode because some of these American companies are applying for licenses to be able to sell to you. Um, how long can you last without supplies coming in from the U.S.? If U.S. companies were to stop supplying us altogether, our production would not stop for a single day in the future. Rather, we would ramp up production. But we will face some difficulties because we need to switch product versions. To do that, we need more staff. This year, we have recruited over 6,000 new employees thus far to optimize or replace existing versions. During a version switch, all teams, including R&D, marketing and sales, and delivery, need to deliver products to customers in new ways. This means a bigger workforce and more costs. There's no lethal risk that threatens Huawei's survival at all. The more advanced the product is, the fewer risks we face. For example, in 5G, America doesn't have many cutting-edge chips. Huawei is the sole provider. Our optical chips are the most advanced in the world. We can live without U.S. suppliers in many areas, but this is not what we want. We want to work with U.S. partners to jointly fulfill the responsibilities we have of building an information society. Huawei is not ambitious. We don't want to dominate the world. We only want to work with our partners to build an information society. If Huawei were ambitious, we would have already dominated the most profitable markets. And so w when you say that you are working, um, you know, you've hired additional staff um, to work hard so you can continue to move forward, is the idea to become increasingly self-reliant and, and what is the goal that you have in terms of how much of the products and components that you want to produce in-house in the future? We still have to depend on the rest of the world because no one will succeed on their own in the information society. We have to depend on the world, including the U.S., so we hope the U.S. will become more open. The U.S. government officials don't know much about Huawei, and if they come to visit our company, they may change their perceptions of us. There are rumors that we are struggling to survive, but you can see how many people are eating in our canteens every day. That means our business is going on as usual. When others stop supplying us, we will use more of our own components. When others resume their supply, we will reduce our production a bit. We maintain some support flexibility, and we will never take the path of self-reliance or isolating ourselves from others. That would never happen. The fact that I'm giving this interview means we are strong enough to survive, and we will continue to be so. If you come by three years later, you will see us still alive, and you may see more buildings in our campus. I, I want to pick up on that point you just made. Um, you said, look, if the U.S. could come closer and see our company, they would realize uh, what this company is about. Why not just invite the administration in? We always welcome U.S. authorities to visit us. Some U.S. politicians drove by but didn't come in and some would rather wait outside while others are meeting us. They're not willing to come in. We can do nothing about that. I suggest they change the color of their glasses so that they may accept the reality. People in U.S. industry and academia know more about us than these politicians. Politicians should listen more to these people so that they may change their misperceptions of us. I want to talk about what, what is kind of at the heart of this, why the U.S. has said it has targeted Huawei, and that is on the concerns of national security. Um, you look at American companies, Cisco, you know, Nortel, T-Mobile, Motorola, they have all accused your company of stealing trade secrets and gone to court with documentation to back up the accusations. Why should those companies or the U.S. government trust you now? New technologies are highly complicated. Although the U.S. is very strong, it hasn't deployed all these technologies yet so they have decided to pick on us by focusing on some insignificant issues. We still trust the U.S. courts for their rulings. They have made rulings on some of our lawsuits and made the right decision on behalf of the U.S. government. We are far ahead of the U.S. companies in terms of new technologies. Huawei has over 11,500 core patents granted by the U.S. government. It has over 90,000 patents that support the foundation of the information society. The U.S. should look more at Huawei's contribution to society instead of finding fault with our weaknesses. The track record in courts for Huawei, at least in U.S. courts, has not been a good one. 
First of all, when Cisco sued Huawei, it was the first time we experienced such a large judicial case. When the Stanford University professors compared codes, all of ours are filed and well documented. The total number of code we had at that time is more than 2.2 million lines. The amount of code in Cisco is more than 20 million lines. Who is copying whom? Secondly, during the code comparison, 1% of the codes have coincidence. This 1% coincidence is also contingent and partly due to open source. We settled the claim, but if we were to keep pushing the case, it was false accusations. Settling was acceptable to us. The Motorola case was triggered by a box with the Motorola logo. Although it was a settlement, they lost the case and paid us legal costs in Hong Kong. How could you say it's our problem? The case with T-Mobile is individual behaviors by our employees regarding a rubber head on a robot arm. The civil case has been ruled and now we're waiting for the court's decision on the criminal case. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, if, if you look at from the U.S. side, there has been a lot of litigation against Huawei and there have been multiple companies that have come forward with these accusations. Can you understand where the distrust on the American side is coming from? This is because Huawei is far ahead of the competition. The U.S. has been used to being the world's number one. They will never believe that anyone is better than them. That's why they have this mindset. In this model, the U.S. will learn its lesson eventually, in three to five years. And this is my last point on this, but, but the accusation is not where you are right now, which is, yes, in fact, a leader in 5G, but that you got here by stealing from American companies. From the very first day Huawei was founded, we have valued intellectual property, IP, and opposed the theft of IP. This is because Huawei is a victim of IP theft, and many individuals in China have stolen our IP. None of our litigation has found that Huawei has maliciously stolen anyone else's IP. We have a complete code comparison with Cisco. The comparison found that we had completely different codes. How did we copy theirs? Only 1% of the code overlapped. And this may be because of open source codes, so this is not a problem. The issue with Motorola is completely fabricated, because the company wants to blame someone else for its collapse. We offered 10 years of help to Motorola. Without my help, the company would fall 10 years earlier. I sincerely helped the company and gave thousands of technical secrets to support it. Then its new CEO wanted to blame me for the fall of his company. The case has been ruled and the U.S. paid me money. How could the U.S. accuse me of stealing IP while they paid me? They paid our litigation costs and admitted the issue was non-existent. Our success has always been created by our own hard work. Do you know how many scientists we have? Do you know how much investment we put in R&D? Our R&D investment ranks number five around the world, and we are a non-public company, which doesn't have much money. We don't have the problem that the U.S. is imagining. There are reports um, that have come out over the last few days that suggest that you have um, significant layoffs over at FutureWay, your R&D um, arm over in the U.S. What do you see as the future of Huawei's presence in the U.S.? First, FutureWay is a U.S. company. According to the U.S. entity list regulations, they cannot send any of their R&D results to Huawei, and no employees of FutureWay are allowed to have any contact with Huawei employees. This makes it difficult for us to manage this company and collaborate with them. We'd better wait for the U.S.'s interpretation of the entity list or the U.S.'s removal of Huawei from the list. The U.S. is home to the world's most advanced science and technology. If they are willing to work with us, we will increase our investment in technical partnerships. If the U.S. is not willing, we'll find other ways to get things done. Before Huawei was added to the entity list, we invested 500 million U.S. dollars into FutureWay in 2018 and planned to invest 600 million dollars in 2019. Now, we cannot make any further investment because we are not allowed to engage with FutureWay employees. What's our next step? This depends on the U.S. government's direction. Just to confirm, um, there are layoffs at FutureWay and your R&D center is essentially on hold right now because of Huawei being on the entity list? Yes, this is all because we cannot engage with FutureWay employees. If we cannot even discuss their work arrangements, how can they do their work? Let me ask you about something that has been a consistent narrative. I know you've heard this over and over, which is um, your military past um, as an engineer in the PLA. And I know historically, um, you know, you've talked about how insignificant that was when you think about when this all played out. But 
the U.S. The administration, which has now put you on the entity list, has continuously raised this. Um, how far do you think you need to go to to convince the administration uh, of, you know, that there is no no tie there right now? Um, I'm wondering if you thought about what more you can do or what more Huawei needs to do to get that message out. I've never considered needing to convince the U.S. administration of my identity. I believe survival is success. In the future, I also won't attempt to clarify who I am to the U.S. government. I am a clean man. I wash myself every day. And I don't think it's necessary to ask people to check whether I am clean or not. There are also many veterans working in U.S. companies. But do we say that these companies are all backed by the U.S. military? I think the U.S. should put themselves in our shoes. China has had over 50 million veterans since the 1970s. And these veterans need to work and make a living. The employment of a veteran does not suggest a company's relationship with the military. The military doesn't have that much money. What's more, I was just a low-ranking member of the army. I've never considered trying to convince the U.S. of who I am and will not in the future. I don't care what they think about me. What matters is that we're better than you in the win markets. No one can rely on others to fight their battles and win markets. I don't believe in any gods. I believe that we can only rely on ourselves, not anyone else. You've been asked this question before um, on whether, in fact, you would be willing to take a call from President Trump. I've heard you say before that, you know, why would he call me? You know, he, he has other things to do. You don't speak the same language. But I've also heard you say recently in an interview that, yes, you are willing to take that call. Where do you stand on that right now? He calls tomorrow. You, you have the conversation with the president. I think you may actually get along with the president. What you did, uh... I think it could be possible. Even my family has said that we have similar personalities because we both think in a bit high-handed way. We have communication channels with the U.S. government, for example, through its Eastern District Courts in New York and courts in Dallas, Texas. The U.S. government can communicate with us through our lawyers. Is it really necessary to ask their big president to make a phone call to me? In addition, communication over the phone may not be clear enough. Lawyers have all the evidence and they can make things clear. They can communicate with us through the lawyers. Huawei is part of the trade conversation, whether you like it or not. President Trump has made it a part of that. And since G20, there has been a back and forth um, with the report suggesting that um, the Chinese government is really pushing the U.S. to reduce the pressure back off on your company as part of a concession from the U.S. side. Um, are, are you willing to, to take that role? If the Chinese government asked you to be involved in these discussions, would you be willing to, to take part? First, the U.S. has filed criminal charges against us instead of attempting to negotiate. As Trump tweeted constantly, he changed his judgment on the situation and wanted to negotiate with us. He tweeted things out by himself during the G20. The United States is a country ruled by law. How do legal issues allow negotiations? The law issue should be resolved in courts, right? The trade between China and the U.S. has nothing to do with us. We barely sell anything to the United States. When the two fight, I don't buy from the U.S. Even if the U.S. wins, I still don't go there. So we have nothing to do with the tension between China and the U.S. Trump has nothing on us. He hopes to use Huawei as a bargaining chip. But China doesn't seem to buy it, right? We won't go to the Chinese government to pull us into the negotiations. I hope the relevant lawsuits will reach their conclusions quickly. The procedures are too long and slow. We still use legal issues to solve this problem with us in the United States, instead of taking the issue into the negotiation. If they need to talk, talk through the lawyers with evidence. Therefore, I am not willing to get involved in the negotiations between China and the U.S and let China to save Huawei, which I don't think is possible. Your House of Representatives has passed a bill requiring the entity list could not be revoked within five years. Five years? How can we wait for five years? Impossible, right? That is to say, we cannot be a bargaining chip, and we are not willing to be part of the negotiation. Second, if we got involved, the Chinese government would have to make concessions for us. Why should China make concessions for Huawei? If they can beat the U.S., why does the Chinese government have to make concessions? If you don't want to give in, you don't give in. How does China fighting with the United States has anything to do with me? Some people comment that the Chinese government could trade off something for Huawei. But Huawei didn't commit any crimes. So why should they have to save us?
I want to talk about where Huawei's business is going. Um, you are in, you have a presence in 140 countries. Um, I know outside of China, Europe has been, been a growth area, big growth area, but as a result of the pressure that has come from Washington, um, you faced a lot of headwinds in some of these markets. The US, as you point out, is virtually zero. Um, Australia has banned Huawei. Japan is now on board. And Europe is still a bit of a mixed picture. Where do you see your growth coming from in the next few years? The direction we are moving in and the pace of our development have not changed, but we will need to make some structural adjustments over the next two years as we switch the versions being used for many of our components, and it will take time to adjust and replace the existing versions. During this transition period, our growth may slow down, but from what we've seen, it won't be by very much. We are continuing to move in the direction we have set, and this direction will not change. What do you mean when you say you have to switch versions? During this transition period, we will face some pressure in terms of production capacity and volume. All that to say, our growth may decrease over the next two years, but it will rebound in two or three years. Is the operating system one of those big challenges that you see? Uh, you made, recently made some comments about um, the internal, the alternate operating system that you've been developing, not necessarily being made to run on smartphones. If you can't use Android, do you have a plan B? First of all, I'd like to say a few words about our in-house OS Hongmeng. This operating system is developed to adapt to future scenarios like the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, industrial control, and autonomous driving. The latency of this system is no more than 5 milliseconds, and sometimes even less than 1 millisecond. We plan to apply this operating system to IoT applications like smartwatches, smart TVs, and connected vehicles. But for right now, we really don't have any plans to apply it to smartphones. Huawei has an agreement with Google, and we respect their work and achievements they have made. We will only look into developing our own smartphone OS when Android is no longer an option. But as for now, we don't plan on it. So it sounds like you're operating under the assumption that Google will get the waiver and be granted a license um, to be able to supply um, Android to Huawei. Are you in touch with Google executives at all? No, I have not met with executives from Google, but I believe both our companies are working hard to resolve this issue. We are working to develop a backup operating system while they are working on communicating with the U.S. government. I hope our efforts will pay off. What about your 5G ambitions? How have you had to, to maybe change the expectation a bit as a result of those very headwinds you talked about? According to our estimations, revenue from our network connection business will drop by 2% as a result of the ban, and our consumer business was affected a bit more severely than expected. Of course, the drop is when we compare with this year's goals, set at the beginning of 2019, but our sales revenue will still be higher than last year. So just to clarify, the 2% decline is on the 5G equipment, the, the smartphones? What specifically were you referring to? This decline will be from the impact of cutting out some minor parts of our business. The 5G part of our business will not be negatively affected. In fact, it will see substantial growth. I want to ask you about something that I think is quite personal for you, which is your, your daughter, um, of course, arrested back in December. Um, you know, your father, you've seen your daughter go through this legal ordeal for several months now. She's in Canada, 24-hour surveillance, ankle bracelet. What do you think, as a father, as you see what has been playing out over in Canada? First of all, we have faith in the law. Under the law, we believe the case will be addressed based on facts and evidence. Emotions cannot resolve anything. The case must be addressed by law. As the legal procedure takes a relatively long time, we have to wait. There is no better alternative. When I call her, she sometimes says they are eating hot pot or making dumplings or noodles. She said she was busy with work for decades and rarely had the chance to relax that she has had in recent months. How hopeful are you that it will be resolved, that, that your daughter will not be extradited to the U.S.? It's not just that my daughter should not be extradited to the U.S., but that she should be freed and acquitted of all charges. She is completely innocent, and it was a mistake to arrest her, but we need to wait for the court's verdict. I want to pull back a bit from talking about Huawei to, to what has been playing out in China. 
Over the last several years, we have seen big growth in tech here in China. You know all the big names, Alibaba, Baidu, obviously Huawei in the mix. And despite that success though, there are those skeptics who say, well, those companies grew because they had no competition, that Western companies could not operate here without a joint venture in place. Is it time to open up the market for the likes of Google or Facebook so that you can actually come forward and say, look, we competed against the best and became the best. Personally, I would like to see a more open market, but this is decided by governments. For example, the U.S. government has the sovereign right to close its doors to Huawei. We will try to persuade them to be more open and less conservative, but the decision is still made by the government. It's the same here. You can also try to persuade the Chinese government. Governments in both countries are conservative. But do you think that cloud exists for these companies until the Chinese government opens its doors to some of these companies? The premise behind these questions is wrong. Huawei has been facing fierce global competition ever since it was founded. In the 1980s, 100% of Chinese communications equipment was supplied by foreign vendors mainly eight vendors from seven countries. These included NEC and Fujitsu from Japan, Lucent from the US, Alcatel from France, Nortel from Canada, BTM from Belgium, Siemens from Germany, and Ericsson from Sweden. We grew up in the small crevices between these Western giants. How could you say we didn't experience full competition? The story is similar in the enterprise communications market, where Cisco used to dominate the world and we started from scratch. But this year, we surpassed Cisco. This is not because Cisco yielded to us, but because we have grown strong by ourselves, tempered through full competition. No one has ever protected us, and we don't expect anyone to protect us in the future. God protects you. God doesn't protect us. We don't believe in God. Yesterday we had a chance to, to walk around the campus and talk to some of your employees. And um, one of the conversations really struck me because there was a, a researcher who said, look, I came to Huawei because it is committed to cutting edge technology, but I worry that um, the technology that I am developing here could be misconstrued as national security concern, that, that essentially he feels the weight of the pressure that is coming from the U.S. You know, what do you say to your employees who are wondering what this means for the future of the company and you know, how they should push forward under all this pressure. In fact, our employees have become more confident. I think this employee said that because he feels his work results are too advanced and too good. He may be proud of himself and is indicating he has made great achievements in an understated way. I think this employee should be praised, as he is proud of himself. He believes the U.S. sees us as a threat, only because we are too advanced. Of course, this is my personal interpretation. I don't know him. Our company allows employees to make some mistakes when communicating with the media. It's fine as long as 60% of what they say is right. And by right, I mean what they really think. Currently, 70% of the international media coverage towards Huawei is negative, and the remaining 30% seems to be neutral. These media outlets do not view us positively, but at least they are friendly to us. Even if 40% of what our employees say is wrong, as long as they keep communicating, they will help turn these negative media reports into neutral ones. So it's a good thing. It doesn't matter if they make some mistakes. We encourage them to speak out about their real experiences and thoughts. We're trying to get to the material impact to the company as a result of Huawei being added to the entity list. Um, you said before that $30 billion is, is the number uh, you've put on the company in terms of the impact from this designation. Does that number still hold? The entity list has injected a sense of crisis in our employees and inspired passion across the company. This has provided an opportunity for us to reposition underperforming managers and replace them with outstanding young employees. This has helped us increase our vitality. In this sense, the entity list is not a negative, but a positive. It has motivated our team. Of course, it would be better if Huawei were removed from the entity list. But even if that doesn't happen, we will not face too much pressure. Some say that the removal may not happen for five years, but will we even need the removal by that point? I don't think so. Despite their attacks, we will not hate the U.S. If we keep chomping away at the grass like sheep, we will just get fat, 
The U.S. is now chasing us like a wolf, so we have to start running. This will help us get fit again and become more effective. I want to try and put a number on this, though. The material impact, is it still $30 billion? In H1 of this year, we enjoyed high-speed growth for about four months. Following the May 16 ban, we continued growing due to the momentum we'd built up previously. Our H1 business results should be very good, but we will see real material impact in the second half of the year. We will release our new financial report in Q1 next year. I believe the results will be quite good. Given the environment that we're in right now, I've heard a lot of uh, people refer to this as a, as a new Cold War, that there is a digital iron curtain that is going up as a result of what the U.S. has done moving forward on pressuring um, the Chinese and trying to sort of constrain the technology. Is, is that where we're headed right now? Although the U.S. is giving us a hard time now, if they stop doing so, we can still be friends. We will continue to buy components from U.S. companies. However, we'll have to be more cautious. In the past, we were comfortable signing 10-year contracts with U.S. companies, buying large quantities of goods from them. But now, we have to sign smaller contracts on a rolling basis, in case they no longer sell us certain components. All the other components will become useless. By signing smaller contracts on a rolling basis, we will be able to more easily bear the losses caused by a supply problem. One of the things that I have noticed um, walking around campus, we saw that image of the plane. You've talked a lot about this plane being able to fly despite having holes in it. Um, uh, why this symbolism? Why, why is that, why have you chosen that plane to represent Huawei? I saw it on the internet shortly after the U.S. put us on the entity list. I had the feeling that it resembled us so much, seriously injured with wounds all over our bodies and with only our hearts beating. The aircraft was able to fly home. I believe we will also be able to fly home and land safe and sound. Is there a particular company or a business leader that you really admire in the U.S.? I admire the leaders of Google, Amazon, and the like. Our family admired Jeff Bezos. When the couple said they wanted to divorce, they got divorced immediately and split $60 billion. Our family doesn't have $60 billion to split. How could you not admire that? I'm also a big fan of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. My younger daughter is a huge fan of Mr. Jobs. On the day he passed away, she was still a little girl and proposed that we have a moment of silence to mourn him. And we did. Why do we have so much admiration for the U.S.? Just think about how the U.S. has become so powerful. All the U.S. giants used to be small companies. They became what they are today by adjusting their structures and changing managers along the way, step by step. Nevertheless, American IT companies have made several major mistakes during their development. The U.S. is abandoning 5G. Even if they have supercomputers and super large capacity connections, the U.S. might still fall behind because they don't have super fast connections. All three of these things are indispensable. That's the reason a new breaking point will appear. That will leave the U.S. behind. Shutting Huawei out today is the start of the U.S. falling behind.